Hi, my name is Marco Ferrer, and the title of the session is Next Level GRPC with Kotlin and Coroutines. In this session, we're going to cover what the available options are for GRPC development on the JVM using Kotlin. We're going to take a look at what the general API ergonomics look like for the available offerings, as well as demonstrate how we can use some of the special features of Coroutines to improve our GRPC service implementations. For those who aren't familiar, Kotlin started out as a JVM-based language developed and released by JetBrains in 2011. It has that since then evolved to be a full multi-platform language, allowing users to write and share code across various runtimes. What Kotlin is most well known for is the fact that it is now an official preferred language for Android development. And this fact is what has caused it to gain so much popularity in recent years. Now, coroutines. Coroutines aren't a new concept. They've existed for quite some time and appeared in various flavors with various names. Some of the more recent examples include GoRoutines. In a few years' time, Java will also have coroutines in the form of Project Loom. Um, one thing each incarnation of coroutines sets out to accomplish is to simplify writing and reasoning about asynchronous software. There are a few key characteristics that Kotlin coroutines embody, which we're not going to cover in this session, but I really do recommend checking out a talk given by Roman Elizarov. Uh, the library lead at JetBrains, and it's called Kotlin Coroutines in Practice, and it's from Kotlin Conf 2018. So to give a little bit of an example as to why we're going to be using coroutines or why we would want to use coroutines for our service development, we are going to do a little toy problem. And in this problem, we're going to start off by executing 10,000 coroutines in parallel. And each of those coroutines are going to sleep for a second and print a period to the console. Um, the total execution time for this comes out to about one second or so, um, if you take factor in the IO of printing out our string. Now, if we look at what that example looks like using threads, um, we'll end up having to kill the process because of the fact that threads, and in specifically in this example, when we're performing our sleep, we're actually blocking that thread and no other computations can be performed. That thread is locked until we're ready or in our sleep uh, finishes. Whereas in the coroutines example, we're not using thread.sleep, but we're using a built-in function called delay. And what delay does is suspend the execution of that method, pauses it essentially, and allows the resources that were going to be blocked by that, uh, by that method, that computation, to be freed up and used for some other task that's been queued up in the background. So with that out of the way, we can take a look at what our gRPC APIs look like in Kotlin. We currently have a few options. There's Crota Plus, a library and suite of Proto C plugins I initially released a few years ago. Uh, there's very recently the Google official binaries or bindings, sorry, released, um, which is very exciting for the community. And finally, there is the wire gRPC runtime developed by Square. For today's session, though, we're only going to focus on the examples written using stubs created by Google and the Crota Plus compiler plugins. Uh, and we'll actually start off by taking a look at unary APIs. So this should look somewhat familiar to developers that have used gRPC Java. It's a service implementation for a unary method, um, but with the key difference being that it's using Kotlin syntax. Now, if we take a look at what that looks like using coroutines, you'll see that first our signature no longer accept an accepts an instance of stream observer. We no longer have to worry about the song and dance of calling on next, on complete, or on error. Uh, the method now has a return type defined that matches our API's response type. You also notice that the method is marked with a suspend keyword, meaning that its execution can be paused and resumed, allowing us to free up resources for other methods that are, or other coroutines that are being executed in the background. Both Protopus and Google's gRPC Kotlin use this, this same syntax, with the one exception being that in Protopus, you can build your methods, uh, your response messages, with a uh, Lambda that accepts and sets all these properties instead of the Fluent Builder. When looking at the unary client usage, though, you see that Coroutine interface doesn't differ much from vanilla Java blocking subs. Uh, with the one exception being that the say hello method in this example is actually suspending method. 
meaning that we're not blocking the current thread while we wait for a response from the server. And then again, if we're using Proto Plus, we actually have builder lambdas for creating and instantiating our protobuf messages to execute our requests. But now, one thing that you're probably going to ask yourself is like, this works well for sequential operations, but concurrency. We need to be able to make calls in parallel, call other things, and aggregate the results of those calls all at once. And we're going to basically show that, although in coroutines, um, in the Coroutine API interfaces, there are no future stubs. Concurrent execution is still made possible, um, but there's a few caveats. One of the caveats being is that we want to adopt Coroutine's practice of explicit concurrency. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but in summary, it means that by default, APIs and methods should behave and execute sequentially. And when concurrency is needed, you should explicitly opt into that so that there's no unknown or unexpected behavior or the risk of um, orphaning resources and not closing out uh, specific things. So instead of needing a whole different stub, we can actually make our code, a code concurrent by wrapping our method calls within a uh, coroutine's async block. Now, we're going to take a look at streaming APIs. Uh, for the sake of brevity, we're only going to cover bidirectional streaming. Um, simply because the client and server streaming APIs, or their implementations at least, uh, they can be inferred easily from these examples. Uh, we'll start with a vanilla Java bidirectional streaming method, but written in Kotlin syntax. And its implementation is very basic in that we validate each request and we respond to the client. And in the event of a client error, we log the description. So the first example we'll go over is using the Croto Plus API, which exposes channels, a coroutine primitive meant for hot streams of data. We're then going to convert that channel into a reactive coroutine stream, also known as a flow. Then we compose an operator for catching and logging client errors. And then you'll notice here that we'll finally be able to consume the stream, performing the same validation and response handling. And throwing our status exception instead of invoking on error or stream observer callback handler. Um, now we can look at what the equivalent looks like using the gRPC Java, uh, gRPC Kotlin uh, official bindings. Uh, the key thing to notice is that instead of accepting two channels, the official bindings will actually accept a flow of requests and return a flow of responses. And these are called streams of data. That's the main difference. But other than that, the implementation remains largely the same. Uh, we'll go ahead and catch and log our client errors and finally consume our requests. And since this is the official bindings, we're using the Fluent Builders to build out our messages. Now, on the other side of streaming APIs, we're going to look at what the client um, implementation is like. We create our stub. And when using Croto Plus, we're, when invoking our streaming method, we actually get returned a pair of two values, our request and response channel. Um, in this example, you'll see that we're actually destructuring those two values into their own separate variables, allowing us to perform operations independently. Um, but funny thing is that the Square Wire API also has a very similar design, with one exception being that the Square API actually uses a custom primitive that behaves the behaves sort of like a data stream. For this example, we're going to kick off our stream with a message that says start iterating. Afterwards, we start consuming our responses. We cancel the call if we receive an invalid in response. Otherwise, we send the next request. And since we're using the Codo Plus uh, variant, you see that we're using the Lambda Builder to instantiate our method to send our response, or create an instance of our response method. Um, when using the official gRPC Kotlin uh, bindings, the API is a little bit different. You'll notice that we actually need to pass in a cold flow, and we'll get a cold flow in response. Now, this makes it difficult when we're trying to um, make changes or re re react to the responses that we're receiving from the stream, like sending requests based off of responses that we've already received. Um, 
But there's very easy ways to get around this limitation. In this, uh, in this specific example, we just instantiate a channel that lets us have a reference to our request stream, and we'll send that into um, our argument for our method. The request channel, we go ahead and we start iterating as well. Only difference is using our Fluent Builders. And we collect our responses and close out our channel once we've completed or we cancel the call once we've encountered some kind of invalid uh, response. So going a little deeper, we're going to look past syntactical differences and we're going to dive into the behavior of what's using coroutines with gRPC. Um, the behavior of our APIs. Specifically, we're going to look at how the concept of structured concurrency and cooperative cancellation affect our API implementations. These concepts are first-class citizens in Kotlin coroutines. They allow us to write safer, more efficient concurrent code. At a high level, coroutines are hierarchical. Their scopes, are, their scopes bear a parent-child relationship with scopes created within them. And we'll see how that plays out when we're orchestrating multiple API calls. Cancellation, cooperative cancellation is very beneficial because we're able to not only terminate unnecessary calls early, but free up those resources so that we can continue processing actual requests that are um, not in an arid state. So here's our small example. We have a method. In this method, we're going to be making three uh, concurrent requests to, um, to a service. Um, each request we're actually going to do uh, fire off in an async block um, and the actual method will suspend until we receive the result from the service before finally we await the results of all three of those and print the message to the console. Unfortunately though, look, one of our calls has failed, which threw an exception and terminated a child coroutine. Now we're still waiting for the responses for the other two calls. And then even though our method requires all the values in order to complete successfully, we don't really need those values anymore. But how do we cancel the other two calls since um, our method is now in an invalid state? Well, since that child coroutine completed exceptionally, it actually propagates its cancellation to its parent. And in this case, the parent begins to now cancel itself Canceling itself uh, essentially equates to notifying all of its children that they need to uh, cease uh, execution. So if they were suspended, go ahead, uh, run any cancellation callbacks that might be registered, but go ahead and, and exit early. And if we look in our case, since we're using gRPC Kotlin, we actually are able to hook into the cancellation of our scope, of our coroutine scope, and call the cancel method on the underlying gRPC call. That means that our scope cancellations are then propagated to the server via the underlying gRPC call and allows us to do some cleanup or actually behave accordingly or react accordingly on the server side while exiting this method early. So now that the children have canceled inside of the uh, parent coroutine, the parent can then be considered canceled. And once it's finished, basically it, it uh, terminates. And what you want to find out though is like, how does that cancellation signal that we sent to the server affect the execution of the server? So if we take a look at service A, one of the services we were calling, and if our service is implemented using coroutines, then the coroutine scope of our method handler is actually canceled. And the flow will match what was done in, uh, in the client side. Essentially, the cancellation will propagate to all of the calls being made to other resources, and that cancellation will actually go all the way down the call graph um, if there are other services that are implementing the, uh, the coroutines or at least hooked into the cancellation uh, hook or the cancellation callback for the uh, service calls. So this is a cooperative cancellation across network boundaries. And it helps prevent our services from, from, from performing unnecessary operations and wasting resources. But it's not 
something that it's not a behavior that we always want. It's, there are times where we want to op, opt out of consolation. There are times where we want to basically ensure that whatever method or, or logic that we're running, that we either complete it successfully or that we wrap it in some kind of transaction and make sure we roll back. There's hundreds of different uh, cases where we actually don't want to terminate, even though the client has finished something. And that's very easy to that that's very easy to implement. Um, there are plenty of ways and options on how you can implement like opting out of uh, cooperative cancellation. Um, the most the simplest option though is just wrapping your method implementation with with context non cancelable and still perform your uh, your logic. And what this will do is just protect your that particular block of code from any receiving any signals that might uh, try to cancel its execution. So we've gone ahead and looked at the APIs that are available, the differences in those APIs. We've looked at how coroutines make our services better, and we've looked at how they make our implementations more concise. But that's not all that we have to really look forward to when it comes to this ecosystem. And what's really exciting is the future. Um, the Google gRPC Kotlin implementation is still new, but it's already gaining a lot of traction. And as optimizations and improvements are made, it'll no doubt solidify Kotlin as a first-class gRPC citizen. Separately, there's exciting work being done to improve the protobuf message support so that we can get native first-class features of Kotlin, like data classes, when we're building out our, our messages. Um, and thinking in the long term, the, the one feature or the one like, thing that keeps coming up in the community is multi-platform gRPC. And what that means is that if we can work to build a multi-platform gRPC implementation, then we're able to use and share our gRPC business logic across our platforms, even more specifically iOS and Android, letting us share that code, letting us centralize it right at once, run everywhere, and actually uh, minimize the work being done by teams that have to support multiple platforms. Um, this is something that's been talked a lot about, but there hasn't been a lot of um, work in that field just because of the fact that gRPC Kotlin uh, in general is still so young. But there are implementations, specifically Square Wire, which is built from the ground up on uh, Kotlin multi-platform that have the potential to fill this niche in the future. Um, so going over all of that, it's, uh, it's easy to see how we have not just evolved, but provided an API that is first-class coroutines API, first-class provided by the actual gRPC team. With all the exciting things coming, uh, it's easy to see how Kotlin and gRPC are really going to start growing much faster now than they've done in previous years. Uh, I thank you all for taking the time to watch my talk. and. Um, I'm going to leave it up for questions and answers now on anything related to either the API designs or just implementations or coroutines in general. Uh, thank you for your time.